Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a seminar sponsored by the Center for Evolution Medicine. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Randy Messy, director of the center. And we're especially glad to be having this seminar in Biodesign. Biodesign is our home, administratively and research-wise, but our physical home is over in Seoul. So it's really nice to be back here um, at our home getting connected with people. I should say before this talk that we're going to have one other in this auditorium later this term by Richard Nisbet. And I'm also going to mention these two talks, today's and Richard Nisbet's, may be the two talks in our whole series that are least connected to the kinds of detailed reductionist research that's often so common at DDI. But they are guaranteed interesting, and because we had overflow crowds for our regular room, we're glad to bring you talks of particular interest here. Uh, many of you heard Mel Connor talk last night on his new book about sex differences and our women superior. We had a wonderful panel discussion. He volunteered, actually he was volunteered, to give two talks during the visit. And I'm so glad he's offered to talk about the paleo diet and its current status. He is actually the originator of the uh, term. In 1985, he and colleagues wrote an article in the New England Journal of Medicine about the paleo diet. Actually, it was about paleo nutrition, I should say. And we're going to hear about what he thinks about this Frankensteinian monster that he created. He has more authority, however, in this area than many people who write about it, because he got his anthropology degree from Harvard and then studied the Kung San in Africa for a number of years, looking at what hunter-gatherers actually eat and what they think about what they eat and how, it's affects, how it affects their health. Um, he then, after teaching at Harvard for six years, decided to do something either remarkable or foolish or creative or brave. He went back to medical school, um, and he didn't just absorb everything. He also took notes and wrote a wonderful book on becoming a doctor that I recommend to you. The book that's record that has inspired lots of us over the years is called The Tangled Wing, and I haven't yet mentioned to Mel how annoying I find it when I get on an airplane and I turn to the lady from Dubuque, Iowa, next to me, and she says, what do you do? And I say, I do evolutionary medicine. She says, you really must read this book by Mel Connor. I think it's really the, um, but it's really inspired lots of us all through, and I think it's good reading even now. So Mel's topic for today is the paleo diet, 30 years on, and I'm very curious to have, hear what he has to say about where we are now. Thank you for being here, Bill. Thank you, Andy. You're too kind. And uh, I must say that uh, I've heard that, that uh, story about the lady in the airplane a number of times. Uh, I doubt if it's happened very many times. <laughs> but um, so. Uh, yesterday I was talking about sex and violence, and today I'm going to talk about the last thing that people probably feel that passionately about, and that's food and what they put in their mouths. I don't want to make you too self-conscious. I know you're having lunch while we speak here, but um, this is the mandate that I'm going to try and cover a lot of history and then uh, bring things up to date. So the rise of evolutionary medicine is quite recent. Darwin did not do that. He actually um, um, was one time planning to do it, but, uh, but didn't continue, fortunately for all of us. And the dawn of Darwinian medicine, as described by, uh, by G.C. Williams and our own uh, Randy Nassi, um, this was declared in, in March 1991, by which time uh, uh, a few things had happened. One aspect of evolutionary medicine is the, the, what we call the mismatch or discordance model. And it, it kind of uh, looks like this in very uh, simple form. You have paleolithic conditions that we evolved in. A few individuals uh, at the end of a Gaussian curve manifest diseases, uh, certain chronic uh, degenerative diseases under those conditions. You keep those genes. You have a new lifestyle, industrial conditions. You get more uh, individuals manifesting disease. That's the, the model. Uh, I'm not asking you to believe this yet. <coughs> so diseases like uh, cardiovascular uh, disease, atherosclerosis, diabetes, and so on uh, uh, get much more, even dental caries get much more common. <coughs> and uh, this is 
where we stand kind of right now. In the 60s, um, the hunter-gatherer uh, movement began in anthropology, because hunter-gatherers were supposed to be the crucible of the human genome. And um, we decided, uh, a lot of us, that foragers were, were really us uh, genetically, and that we needed to understand them uh, in every way possible in order to understand ourselves. So Richard Lee and Irvin DeVore, two of my teachers, <coughs> published this very important book in 1968 based on a conference a few years earlier uh, in which uh, hunter-gatherer experts from throughout the, the world gathered and tried to make some generalizations. So very impressive, a hunting major with a gathering minor. <coughs> Turns out that that's not very impressive. He wouldn't get the job because you have to have a gathering major and a hunting miner if you want to be uh, a Bushman kind of hunter gatherer. Uh, and a few years later, this book was published, and it looked like the the contribution to subsistence in hunter gatherers was going to break down. Seventy or so percent of females contributed, and and uh, thirty percent male. Um, hasn't worked out to be that simple. But this is how it was decided who would do what. On second thought, you hunt, I'll gather. And um, we don't know how it exactly came about, but we do know that, um, and I'm giving away the ending a little bit, we now think that about 50% of subsistence in the average hunting and gathering group is provided by each gender, but that, that there's a tremendous range. So the hunting gatherer party line, shown here, says that <clears throat> we want we're all doing this, and then gradually uh, other modes of subsistence, agriculture, herding, uh, uh, took over, and hunter gatherers receded to small pockets where they were studied in the 19th, and 20th, and 21st centuries. Um, <clears throat> uh, among other things that he's accomplished, uh, Kim Hill, who's here. Uh, He's done great studies of, uh, of the Ache who live in this part of the world, <coughs> and, uh, and there have been great advances in our understanding of, of hunter-gatherers from him and, uh, and Maggie Hurtado and other, uh, many others. The Kung, <coughs> whom I studied, are located here, and uh, they have a semi-arid environment, see pictured here hunt a small game occasionally, uh, and a migratory larger game, but uh, the, although the vegetation is sparse, uh, women uh, and gathered goods, gathered food, uh, are, are accounting for 70% of the diet by, by weight. And that's yours truly in better days, practicing the well-known anthropological method of participant interference. Hunting isn't always exciting. Uh, there's a lot of waiting, there's a lot of <coughs> uh, trap setting, there's making arrows and po putting poison on them. Uh, and, and gathering is, is also uh, not the most exciting thing in the world, but it's very, very important and provides the, the basis of, of this group's life. Mongongo nuts are the staff of life. Women uh, walk up about six miles on average to Mongongo Grove, carrying 30, and when they come back, they're carrying 30 pounds of nuts plus one or two uh, children. Birth spacing is four years, and uh, uh, that makes it a little easier to do this. And they, they're uh, very active and uh, very social in these gathering uh, expeditions. Um, this is a Mongongo nut <coughs> with fruit on it. And this is the, the breakdown of the nutrients in the nut. It is a very, very good source of, uh, of, of macronutrients. And, and, uh, uh, and again, this is the staff of life. Um, this is an ostrich egg shell used for carrying water. Water people disperse into the desert in the wet season, come back to the main water holes in the dry season. Uh, and that ability to move is, is and, and for groups to fission and come back together uh, or re-aggregate re to some extent in different ways is very important. This is what you would see if you walked into a, a village <coughs> at that time in history. 
And I personally was doing a sort of multidisciplinary team, and I was doing research on infant uh, development and on um, the relationship between nursing and uh, and this four-year birth space and very intensive nursing uh, pattern for going on for uh, at least three years, and the uh, the pattern of breastfeeding was four times per hour during the daylight hours, and that resulted in the suppression of ovarian function, and that is a very common pattern in hunter-gatherer groups uh, around the world. So uh, what were they being weaned to? And not this. So this is the discordance <coughs> that we face today. Uh, and I'm not going to talk much more about uh, about infant feeding, although I certainly think that, that breastfeeding recommendations have have come more and more into line with uh, the hunter-gatherer model over the decades since that time. I don't take credit for that, but it, it, it has happened. And, and these are children uh, uh, learning about subsistence, <coughs> pretending about subsistence, feeding themselves by digging up a, a root. Uh, and this little girl has got a gigantic smile on the face because she killed a bird. Uh, if she were doing that here, she would be referred for treatment. Uh, <coughs> culture is palace. And children have lots of time and energy to play, which suggests that they're not uh, um, in, in marginal nutritional condition. Uh, and there's other evidence for that, too. So food, clothing, and shelter. I wish there was some way we could simplify our lives. Unfortunately, li their lives get much more complicated than just food, clothing, and shelter. And they are concerned about a lot of the same things that people in our culture and other cultures are. They have a, a religious uh, uh, ceremony, uh, which again takes a tremendous amount of energy and intensity. Uh, and they devote a lot of time and energy to building relationships. And that's the thing they worry most about, whether their relationships are OK, not whether they're going to get a lion bite that, that they sort of know how to avoid. But their relationships are very crucial and, and less predictable. And this is just to suggest to you uh, uh, the fact that a small-scale society like this has the same range of variation in personality as as there are more than in this room, for sure. And, uh, but the same as, let's say, in Phoenix. Uh, in, in, I'm talking about range of personality, not ethnicity, of course. And this society did not stagnate or stay the same. It is, <coughs> has been subject to a lot of uh, change since that time. So according to Thomas Hobbes, the philosopher, life in the state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. But really, it's anything but solitary, very social. Poor, but by whose standards? And uh, rare, uh, usually adequate, rarely desperate. Certainly not nasty or brutish, but full, humane, skillful, spiritual, varied, and funny. Great sense of humor uh, in, in this culture, and it is short for some, long for others. Typical pre-modern mortality. I get back to that. So here's our first version of uh, of ancestral health. And uh, Randy was asking me uh, <coughs> what the Bushman would think of the Big Mac, and I put in this a picture from a New York Times article I, I wrote about this, uh, and and. Uh, the Bushman is looking skeptical, but actually, in, in reality, as, as Randy said, uh, breakfast, it, it, this guy would just absolutely pounce on, uh, on this and, and, uh, and think it was the best thing that ever happened to his palate. So, <clears throat> um, Paleolithic Nutrition, the article that uh, uh, Randy mentioned, published in January 1985, and tried to we, you know, strictly speaking, it should have been called hunter-gatherer nutrition because we're trying to estimate the the range of diets and and, me, and the mean and modal kind of diet in hunter-gatherers, and not and there wasn't very much work uh, from the archaeological fossil record at that time. But here's what we estimated, and I'm not going to go into detail on this uh, uh, because it's changed, but certainly uh, it was not only very different from my macronutrients and micronutrients not only very different from the contemporary American diet, but also different from the then current uh, 
recommendations. And, and you can see that um, uh, cholesterol levels uh, uh, were not lower <coughs> but um, in the hunter-gatherer diet. But uh, we estimated at the time that, that some other things considered uh, uh, problematic were, were uh, closer to the recommendations in, in the hunter-gatherer diet than to the, the then current American diet. Uh, and, and we estimated <coughs> that given, we understood that there was variation, so uh, the animal to vegetable ratio would range from 20-80 to 80-20. And you'd have different uh, nutrient composition, macronutrient composition in those different combinations. And at the time, we estimated that uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the right ratio would, would to represent the classical hunter-gatherers, I'll tell you what that means in a second, would be 35 to uh, 65. Um, classical hunter-gatherers are the ones who live in a range of environments, including tropical forests like Ken Hills, the Aceh people, uh, savannas like the the Hadza, semi-arid environments, like and and uh, and and lots and lots of others, but that would have been relevant to human evolution. Uh, that is not including people like the Eskimo, uh, because not, none of human evolution took place in the Arctic. Uh, not including equestrian hunters, because none of human evolution took place. Uh, in, 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 in that setting. So we wrote <clears throat> this book in 1988. I, I want to specify to you that Boyd Eaton is, uh, is the first author on most of these papers for, for uh, a good reason. He was the impetus and leader uh, in, in this for, for most of the for then and most of the time since. And, um, and this was the response, not to, not to the book, but actually 1985 uh, to the, the first article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So check ads for specials on saber-toothed tigers. Cavemen cooked up a healthy diet. We passed the mastodon. And uh, the caveman diet, this is our editorial in the Washington Post. Uh, and they said, so count on the, at the end, so count on this, someday in the near future, you look out at daybreak and see people <coughs> all up and down your street come loping out of their homes wearing designer skins and wielding L.L. Bean stone axes while every dog, cat, and squirrel in the neighborhood runs for cover. And uh, then Ellen Goodman, a wonderfully funny columnist for the, uh, the Boston Globe, <coughs> said, do I sound suspicious of this back to primeval basics mo movement? The truth is that I fully accept my genetic ancestors as health mentors. Some of them did develop medical problems, lion bite, for instance, that we rarely see in the civilized world, but I'm convinced that the average paleolithic person was a very role model of good health when he died at the ripe old age of 32. Well, obviously, I, I get this a lot. I've been getting it ever since 1985. 32 is the, the typical pre-modern mortality in all kinds of pre-modern Society, that the typical pre-modern longevity in, in all kinds of pre-modern uh, settings, uh, and it's it's arrived at by dividing huge infant mortality um, by you know a, a, a plus uh, all the other ages that people live to, including uh, quite elderly uh, some uh, quite elderly, and then you come up with 32. And if you life, life expectancy in this kind of in, in the uh, Nancy Howell, great demographer, showed um, is uh, is about uh, 55 at age at age 15. So you can expect to live 40 more years if you make it through childhood on average. And there are some people in their 80s. And this is the Fort Lauderdale News. Uh, so people had fun with this, obviously. No one's asking you to exist on leaves and roots, but the caveman may have had a good diet idea. Researchers are saying the caveman's high fiber, low fat, low sugar, and low salt regimen could be a standard for modern human nutrition. So that's where, where, the way we saw it then. By the way, I, I pulled this out of the file to, to scan it the other day, and uh, I noticed for the first time that on the back of that front page was 
nutritionists follow in Neanderthal's footsteps, complete with recipes, which I Xerox for my wife, who's obsessive about food. Uh, and we, uh, we all, I also noticed that we were selling fried chicken, free biscuits, and more, uh, <coughs> which is not what we were trying to sell. A few year, years later, we published uh, this, this paper on health markers in, in various uh, so-called primitive societies. And, and in higher gatherers, the serum cholesterol was less than 150. And well, I'll just go through. And there was no increase in blood pressure with age. So <clears throat> here you have a uh, tricep skin fold. This could just mean that, that they're very skinny because they're not eating enough. Uh, but when you look at aerobic fitness, uh, you don't get that <clears throat> idea. Uh, they have superior aerobic fitness to uh, Canadians, uh, to use as a comparison group. And, uh, and that is um, uh, not compatible with the idea that they're they're thin just because they're starving. Um, diabetes prevalence is, is extremely low in, in these populations. And we're not just talking about hunter-gatherers, but also uh, other um, uh, pre-civilization or non-industrial non societies. And this number for uh, diabetes prevalence and uh, in advanced societies has greatly increased since 1988 and is continuing to increase. So it's, uh, it's like 15 or, or so, 18%, uh, depending on the population. Serum cholesterol, look at, look at the serum cholesterol values in hunter-gatherers, <coughs> even the Eskimo who are eating blubber and, and lots of other fat. And uh, uh, in rudimentary horticulturalists, it's not much higher. Uh, if you have high serum cholesterol, you're liable to get this, which is a atherosclerotic uh, process blocking your some important arteries. And coronary artery disease increased greatly uh, in the 19th and 20th century, but began to decrease uh, <clears throat> a few decades ago. And now it's expected to, to uh, have an uptick again because of uh, the tremendous increase in diabetes prevalence. Diabetes is one of the highest, uh, uh, most prominent risk factors for heart disease. So we are obviously in trouble. You've heard plenty about this. And this is the curve of, uh, of obesity over time. Uh, and this is the diabetes prevalence. And if it, if, if it looks to you like the diabetes prevalence is being dragged along by the, uh, by the rising obesity curve, that's correct. And this is, type, this is type 2 diabetes, which used to be called adult onset diabetes, but now, um, now out, outnumbers in some pediatric practices. It certainly rivals numbers uh, type 1 diabetes which used to be called childhood diabetes. And, uh, and this is due to uh, uh, the changes in our diet and lifestyle. So in 2010, we published this update. <coughs> and um, we said that human diets were prevalent uh, during our evolution were characterized by much lower levels of refined carbohydrates and sodium, much higher levels of fiber and protein and comparable levels of fat, primarily unsaturated fat and cholesterol. Physical activity levels are also much higher than current levels, resulting in higher energy throughput. And we said at the outset, I'm going to say this repeatedly, that such evidence could only suggest testable hypotheses, not be a, a, an automatic guide to what you should eat, like some people on the internet now uh, consider it. But in any case, redefining the diet as best we could, much lower levels of refined carbohydrates and sodium, much higher levels of fiber and protein, physical activity levels much higher. And uh, so I'm going to simplify this, comparing uh, hunter-gatherer diet to the contemporary Western diet, you have uh, <coughs> 
in uh, in contemporary Western, uh, you have uh, higher caloric density. Uh, you actually have less energy intake because of higher throughput, uh, less dietary bulk, and fiber, and um, um, uh, refined carbohydrates. Uh, more or equal serum cholesterol raising fat, that is uh, saturated animal fat, and, uh, and less polyunsaturated fat, and a, um, uh, an unfavorable ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids, and, uh, but equal levels of, of cholesterol intake, and a, a much different ratio of sodium to potassium intake. And I'm going to qualify that one uh, a, a little bit. We also looked at, in this 2010 paper, we looked at what had happened to the recommendations since our first papers. This is the papers, this is the recommendations from authorities like the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, et cetera, uh, in the 80s. Uh, this, these are the current recommendations. These are the estimated uh, ancestral or hunter-gatherer ones. And here, we, we were interested in the fact that, that uh, recommendations moved in the direction of the ancestral, the estimated ancestral diet. So here, there is a, a, a decrease in the uh, recommended amount of uh, added sugar, a decrease, an increase in the recommended amount of fiber. Actually, there was no recommendation in the 80s. Um, the, uh, there was a change in uh, in the ceiling for protein intake, uh, there was uh, a change, a, a big decrease in the recommended maximum for uh, the recommended daily intake of sodium versus potassium. And uh, in terms of biomarkers, a decrease in the recommended uh, top blood pressure you should have, a decrease in the men recommended uh, top serum cholesterol you should have. And in every one of these cases that I just showed you, the recommendations have moved toward the estimated ancestral diet that we put forward. And they didn't move because of us. Uh, that's not what I'm suggesting. They moved because of research uh, of completely different kinds. But it, it's very interesting to, to see that the recommendations are moving in, in that direction. So here's how I think about, about how you should go about this, this stuff and think about it. First, try and make the best estimate of hunter-gatherer diets. Then you confirm uh, that your estimates with the fossil record. Uh, then you, make, you have clinical observations, uh, long, a long history of them that you try and, try and integrate with that. And you have animal model experiments. And then you have the gold standard, which is in gold here for a reason, randomized controlled trials in human subjects. And you don't get a recommendation until you get past step five. You just get hypotheses. Uh, and even, uh, even with, I, you know, I left out, um, sorry, epidemiology, which is very important. Uh, in a way, those are clinical observations. But, you know, big epidemiological studies, it's terrific. They've been very important. But uh, they're not decisive because they don't prove causality. They just prove correlations. And that's why you need these other steps, especially the last one. So that's why I am so incredibly excited to report to you that paleo has gone random. Uh, we had the first randomized controlled trials. And the, and the ones that I'm going to show you, you know, the ones that compare, compare the paleo diet to another diet are not comparing it to the, the routine standard background diet. They're comparing it, comparing it to other recommended diets for, for people to avoid heart disease or, or diabetes. And uh, in this case, Mediterranean-like diet. So the paleo diet in this uh, study by the Swedish group based on lean meat, fish, fruits, vegetables, root vegetables, eggs, and nuts. <coughs> Let me not neglect to mention uh, a couple of things here. First of all, I am not talking, uh, just not to talk about sustainability. I know that's a big concern, it's my concern too, 
but this is about this is about diet and, and lifestyle in relation to health. Uh, sustainability is not going to come up. The other thing is that it's not about not going to be about the the details of which species of fish or farmed versus versus uh, uh, <coughs> wild fish or uh, Atlantic versus Pacific salmon or what <coughs> how you figure out which fish has the most mercury and other toxins that's beyond the scope of, of this talk you, 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 that you have to figure out for yourself. And <coughs> so the consensus Mediterranean diet is whole grains, low fat dairy products, vegetables, fruits, fish, oils, and margarines. And the, in uh, the oral glucose tolerance test, the paleo diet sample did uh, substantially better in, uh, uh, in the curve of plasma glucose. There's a uh, 2014 study, <coughs> also a randomized, two-year randomized trial of the effects of Paleolithic type diet in postmenopausal women. And <coughs> um, so this was compared to the Nordic nutrition recommendations. This was from a different Swedish uh, or a Nordic group. Uh, and the uh, conclusion of Paleo diet has greater beneficial effects versus an NNR diet regarding fat mass, abdominal obesity, and triglyceride levels. Uh, but adherence to protein intake is, is difficult, and that's been found several times. So here you have a subjective satiety, very interesting randomized crossover study, paleolithic diet based on lean meat, fish, fruits, vegetables, root vegetables, eggs, and nuts, is more satiating per calorie than a diabetes diet, recommended diabetes diet, in patients with type 2 diabetes. Nevertheless, it was once again difficult to adhere to. Uh, so it's not easy for average people, even in a study, to, uh, to stick to the, the paleolithic diet. But this is, shows a, a much bigger impact on fat distribution and fat mass. <coughs> By different measures uh, of the paleo diet. And some non-randomized non trials, uh, you have an improvement in uh, lipid concentrations and, and hypercholesterolemic adults compared to a traditional heart-healthy diet. Uh, four months of paleolithic nutrition significantly lowered mean total cholesterol, increased HDL, independent of changes in body weight. <coughs> uh, and Finally, a, a study in uh, obese postmenopausal women that was not randomized uh, showed that a modified paleolithic type diet had strong and tissue specific effects on, on lipid deposition. So, I'm going to now spend the rest of the time taking up some challenges <coughs> to, uh, to our outlook that have come up over the years. Uh, the first one <coughs> is the idea that hunter-gatherers took it, uh, on, on average took in much more meat than we estimated. And the emblematic experience of this for me was visiting the Ancestral Health Symposium in 2013, uh, where I gave one of the keynote addresses. And I'm going to tell you, I walked in there breakfast time before my address, and there was a big sign saying, bacon fried and lard. And they were these little jars of things that looked like jam, but they were actually made from animal fat. And, and then when we had the closing dinner, uh, they had a, a, a burger uh, place in Atlanta cater, uh, um, and, and they had burgers without buns. Burgers, lettuce, and tomato, no, no bun in sight. Now, these folks <coughs> are at one end of the continuum of what people on the internet call the, the paleo diet. They are very committed to it. A uh, 62-year-old lady I chatted with was very fit, in good shape. Uh, and it seemed like to me anyway, I did uh, examine her. But, uh, she said, I can't tolerate more than 30 grams of carbohydrates in a day. Uh, a couple of days later, I ran into someone uh, running around my neighborhood, fantastic-looking young guy in his mid-twenties, and uh, 
And he recognized me and we got a, 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 a started chatting. And I said, how much carbohydrate do you eat in a day? And he, he did this. Okay. This is a very low carbohydrate version of the paleo diet. And, and um, I'm here to tell you that it's completely unjustified by, by anything I know about uh, or anything that's been published about hunter-gatherer diets. But there was some difference of opinion between <coughs> Boyd and me. Lauren Cordain came into the, the group, and uh, they estimated that from a, a cross-cultural sample of hunters and gatherers that the actual uh, peak uh, mean and medi median uh, of, of hunter-gatherer diets was uh, uh, between 55 and 65 percent uh, animal flesh. But unfortunately, this sample included equestrian, many equestrian hunters and several Arctic hunter-gatherer groups that were not relevant. And when you want a relevant sample, <clears throat> I recommend one of the places you can get it is by going to uh, Frank Mollock's wonderful book about the Hadza. He has a chapter called The Medium Foragers. And it tells you uh, in, what in uh, 179, cultures was the, uh, the distribution of gathering, hunting, and fishing, uh, respectively 53%, 26%, 21% by weight. And the male versus female contribution to the diet is about 50-50. And that's the way I look at it now, with a lot of variation around uh, those, those uh, estimates. So we took the 1980s estimate and moved it higher. And that's where we would put it now, around 50, 50, uh, and uh, or call it 45 to 55 percent, um, which would, uh, would capture a good, good bit of the range. So here's a, a, a new paper helping to answer the challenge from the ancestral health people. This is in the Quarterly Review of Biology, September 2015, uh, and uh, a group led by Karen Harvey, who, uh, who found that uh, pre-modern, uh, I'm sorry, pre-agricultural uh, pre humans, Paleolithic humans in the archaeological uh, record uh, were eating a substantial amount of, of plant food. Uh, it's hard to estimate exactly how much. And also, I'm grateful to Ann Stone for calling my attention to this last night. Uh, there, the copy number variation, I'm sorry, this is not clear, in the salivary amylase genes uh, suggests a, a considerable antiquity for, for genes for an enzyme that, that is for digesting starches that have specifically that have been cooked. So, uh, it seems that they were eating a fair amount of those. This 19, uh, 2014 uh, paper uh, from Allison Brooks's group, um, you have a study of Neanderthal teeth showing uh, from the tooth enamel that they were eating uh, uh, substantial amounts of plant food just as early modern humans were. And uh, so they reviewed that data and, uh, and studied the dental calculus uh, and from evidence from dental, in the dental calculus and stone tool, tool um, found, uh, for example, barley seeds that were, that, that were eaten. Barley was eaten both cooked and raw. And Allison Brooks has suggested that the Neanderthals were drinking barley broth. And the Neanderthals are the ultimate meat eaters, supposedly, in, in, in anthropological, uh, recent anthropological tradition, even more than early modern humans. And, um, and so even they don't justify the extreme uh, paleo diet. So the, paleo, the claim that paleo diet was 65% uh, animal products or higher is not <coughs> sustainable, but a 50-50 a ratio is uh, more realistic with a big range of variation. Another challenge came from this famous China study, uh, which uh, seemed to confirm that you need to have uh, less than this amount of, of animal flesh in your diet. So we got pretty well got the extremes of steak 
faked out here. Uh, China study ha has been heavily criticized, and uh, but you have uh, I have, and and you can read about what Lauren Cordain himself had to say to uh, the head of the China study, uh, and. Uh, certainly, Cordain has, and others have had good arguments against it. But in my own family, at Thanksgiving one year, we had two, we had two vegans, vegetarians, gluten-free person, uh, and uh, uh, and regular people who ate turkey. So uh, the the all those people are healthy. So that's a theme that I'm gonna have to return. To um, and uh, but the claim that human uh, diet should contain no more than 10% protein, mainly from plants, is false. Uh, and uh, and there have been uh, criti uh, criticisms in uh, in various venues. <clears throat> A uh, archaeologist named uh, Christine Warner had made explicit criticisms of the paleo diet. Um, but she's criticizing the paleo diet, debunking the paleo diet uh, as described by the Ancestral Health Society kind of people uh, with 30 grams of carbohydrates a day or something like that. Uh, and, and she's an archaeologist characterizing uh, a different kind of paleo diet. Uh, and she says diversity is the key. Certainly, hunter-gatherers all have to, to adapt to different diets at different times of year and, and uh, move around and, and exploit different foods and whatever they can get. Uh, so diversity is very important. So one of, among the reasons not to believe that we're 95% we're carnivores is we have grinding molars. <coughs> we need vitamin C from plants. We have the dental calculus evidence from the fossil. Uh, archaeological record is biased toward bone, so you're going to think if you just look at the article, uh, the archaeological record, well, these people are eating all animal flesh because there's so many animal bones uh, in, in their habitats. And brain grinding goes back at least 30,000 years, among other uh, findings. So carnivory certainly changed the hominin diet but against the background of plant foods, Rick Potts and others have long uh, emphasized environmental variability as the key to understanding human dietary adaptation. Allison Brooks find grindstones even 280,000 years ago. Chris Marion uh, here finds shellfishing 164,000 years ago and thinks it's very crucial to understanding human evolution. And uh, other archaeologists like Mary Steiner point to increased diet diversity at, uh, at about 70,000 years ago. So diversity is, is the basis of the, of the adaptation. Uh, <clears throat> Curtis Marion uh, uh, talked about how the sea saved humanity based on his research at Pinnacle Point. And uh, he, he uh, showed that there were the long term uh, a subsistence base that included large amounts of shellfish uh, in this site near near the sea in South Africa, and he thinks it was crucial to human evolution. That you ha you have to think about that as part of the story, <coughs> although there are plenty of places that were far from the sea. And this is where I have to qualify the salt question a little bit. People are living near the sea; they don't have a salt deficit, but people living inland uh, or hunter gatherers. Um, are not able to get the you know the amount of salt that we get in a day, which is in the order of eight to ten grams, or an order of magnitude higher than the Paleolithic uh, estimates, hunter-gatherer estimates. Uh, so the claim that the paleo diet is bunk is tr really not true, or rather, it's true about the straw man, or about the ancestral health society type Paleolithic diet. Now here's a very interesting challenge, which is the finding of atherosclerosis in ancient mummies. So we claimed that atherosclerosis is, uh, is uh, a relatively new disease, but it has been shown that that uh, 
mummies, <coughs> Egyptian mummies uh, of these ages, the peak in the, in the 40s, have up to 50% uh, of their uh, uh, arteries showing evidence of atherosclerosis. Here's atherosclerosis in the carotid artery of one of them. Uh, and so what happens to the idea of, uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of a mismatch and, and, and uh, atherosclerosis being a new disease? Well, here's what happens. We never said, we always said these diseases existed in the past. We just said they're much more common now. And, and these are the elite, these mummies are the elite of the, of the Egyptian population, of course. And uh, I'm going to, this is, this is one study of prevalent calcium in, in uh, the Netherlands in a study. Uh, um, but here's, uh, the, yeah, so the Rotterdam study uh, showed about 3% of individuals with no calcification. And, um, and you have a much higher uh, percentage uh, with, uh, uh, with calcification in these modern studies than you do in, uh, in even in the mummies who are well-to-do. So even if we accept the, them as representative of our hunter-gatherer past, which they're certainly not, there's still a very large increase. So the claim that uh, atherosclerosis is an inherent component of human aging and not characteristic of any specific diet or lifestyle is unwarranted uh, in my view. So now we have the question of, of salt, which has become complicated in this article in Time uh, in 2013, uh, announcing that, that uh, this whole salt thing had been greatly exaggerated. but. Uh, other other studies uh, have consistently showed that uh, that salt is a contributing factor to hypertension, that it is a separate contributing factor to heart disease besides its mediation through hypertension, and and that it um, uh, it, it is not good to have too much of it, and that's <coughs> uh, a qualification. Uh, about authoritative bodies uh, being congruent and supporting a population-wide reduction in current levels of sodium intake based on randomized controlled trials and epidemiological studies and animal studies and lots of other things. And so this is one study that showed, uh, uh, or two studies that showed that uh, reducing an intervention, reducing salt intake would uh, uh, would in fact reduce blood pressure. The meta-analysis of 14 studies uh, and 37 uh, cohort studies and 37 uh, randomized controlled trials showing that there is a reduction uh, in, in sodium uh, and that high quality evidence in non-acutely ill adults shows that reduced sodium intake reduces blood pressure. Uh, so the claim is that markedly reducing salt intake is not beneficial to health, and that is false, in my view. I, I will not say that this is not controversial. It is, it is still controversial, uh, but I would also point out that, that they, none of the studies have gotten as low as the average hunter-gatherer salt in, estimated salt intake level uh, in, uh, uh, in the experiment or certainly in the epidemiological uh, studies. Now, in 2012, Herman Ponser and his colleagues did a study of the Hadza, which uh, Hadza activity, and um, they cast doubt on the idea that activity really matters, and that activity level is really different in hunter-gatherers. Um, and this was published. Uh, <clears throat> in PLOS One, using they they used a, uh, a, a gold standard uh, test uh, of energy expenditure, uh, which is double labeled water, and uh, 
Hunter wrote a, uh, an article in the New York Times debunking the hunter-gatherer workout and saying that the uh, the hunter-gatherers were no more, uh, were, or had no higher energy throughput than uh, we do, sedentary Westerners. Uh, but this was criticized uh, 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 as having not, <coughs> uh, because of their adjustment for body size, it seemed like a reasonable thing to do, but it's strongly correlated with energy expenditure. Smaller people expend much less energy, just a simple physics. Now, one of the resolutions to this, so uh, uh, it was not irresponsible to do the study, but I would suggest it might have been like, like uh, Dr. Dolly, that it might have been irresponsible to, um, to publicize it so widely, uh, to publicize exercises, not an activity is not mattering, and this is his um, his blog. If you want to pursue that, but it's kind of been bypassed by by a just published article by Ponser and his group, which kind of sort of waved the white flag <coughs> uh, by demonstrating uh, that daily physical activity does not may not predict total energy expenditure in hunter gatherer populations like the Hadza. Instead, adults with high levels of habitual physical activity may adapt by reducing energy allocations to other phys physiological activity. And the, the other thing to understand about this is that activity, the relationship between activity and health doesn't uh, depend on, uh, on energy throughput. So activity is good, is good for you. Uh, and uh, <coughs> And the various, in various ways, as shown by countless studies. So originally, he said in the Times, uh, we're getting fat because we eat too much, not because we're sedentary. Now, statistically speaking, that might still be true, but it's certainly not true that uh, uh, being sedentary doesn't matter at all. And the reality is, we're getting fat because of both. And finally, is the the in some ways, the most fundamental problem is that since our original studies, uh, we've learned that the genome did not stand still for the last 10,000 years. It has changed a lot in important ways. That, uh, uh, that, and, and some of them are, are known to be, some of the ways it's changed are known to be related to nutrition, like the evolution of, uh, of, of lactase for digesting milk sugar in populations that were uh, pastoral uh, herders. Um, so, does that to throw the whole discordance hypothesis into uh, into the wastebasket because of genetic changes? Well, some some people have strongly emphasized the amount of genetic change, like um, Conklin and Harpending. Um, certainly, the the old idea. That, that civilization and culture and civilization stopped evolution or slowed down evolution. That's a dead idea. And um, here's a, uh, an example of, uh, uh, of a study showing uh, that, that many gene changes have taken place. So, what is my answer? For, first of all, the biggest changes in our environment and, and the biggest increases in chronic degenerative disease have happened in the last two centuries. And nobody has argued that there are significant genetic changes in, in the last two centuries. Or another thing, there's <coughs> not evidence of genetic evolution that protects us against the epidemic of chronic diseases. Um, so I, I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to stop. But I, I want you to know that uh, uh, these wars go on. Uh, low, very low uh, flesh diets are still being strongly defended. Uh, some people have pronounced the idea that saturated fat is bad for you uh, to be dead. Uh, and uh, the paleo diet is alive and well in 
uh, in a Whole Foods supermarket and, uh, in Ann Arbor. And actually, the recommendations in those leaflets are pretty good. They're not like the, uh, um, the so-called paleo diet of the ancestral health society. OK, so I know some of you have to leave soon. Uh, and, but I'm happy to take questions from arguments and whatever. First word on this. Do you want to stand up? Or? I don't want to stand up, but um, I guess I'm going to have to quibble a little with point one. Uh, yeah, Lauren Cordain, Boyd Eaton, me and a lot of other people think that you're still underestimating animal flesh in ancestral diets. And I'm not talking about protein, I'm just focusing on animal flesh. There are several problems with why we probably don't really know the answer, but if I had to make a guess, I would say you're still underestimating. Um, so what would your estimate? So th this, there's an illusion that some of what you presented is evidence. Frank Marlowe's book has 179 societies with numbers calculated down to 1% of um, composition of diet. There are no measurements for 179 societies. The diet has been measured in 11 studies, 11 and only 11. We published this in 2002. Nine of those 11 show way more than 50% of the diet, energy in the diet coming from meat. Two show less than 50%. That's the database that we have to work with that's actually measured. The rest of it is all hand-waving. The biggest suggestion that maybe it's unlikely that plants made up 50% of the diet in most places is simply extrapolating from foraging return rates. John Altman's book is a fantastic example showing that it's not possible that any of the natives in Arnhem Land could have ever gotten 50% of their diet from plants because when you experimentally measure the return rates from all the available and known eaten plants, and you multiply that out by the number of hours per day that women could possibly forage, you can't ever account for 50% of the diet. So even though these people are no longer living as full-time hunter-gatherers, we can be quite comfortable that more than 50% of their diet was coming from meat. Maybe and, in that particular environment. I mean, what, what's, that, your, what's so, your... What's and, your and my, so oh. my final last critique, and then I'll say my estimate. Um, a lot of some of the least uh, meat-heavy diets that have been reported are from er from hunter-gatherers that were studied during periods of time when large game were heavily depleted. I include both the Hadza and the Kung in that category. There's lots of evidence that in earlier periods of time there was much more meat in the diet before those two regions became depleted. Richard Lee's 21-day study, which had such impact in anthropology, is 21 days. Uh, he took the people out to the Mongongo groves in his Land Rover, multiple trips, greatly exaggerating the amount of plant in the diet because okay, he was I, wait, the, 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 We're going to have to agree to disagree about this. So, I, yeah, yeah, know, I the, Hadza, the Hadza are not a 21-day study. The, the Hadza under those have... Conditions. The Hatsa diets, the earliest measures are the highest in meat, and every year that they republish the diet, it gets lower and lower and lower. Okay. Uh, well, Frank I, and Brian know, I'm, and all I'm these open, people I'm agree open that, to learning more about this. I'm not going to okay, throw so out 179 societies. I don't societies. think we know the answer yet as to how much meat was in the diet, but many of us believe that it's higher than the numbers that you're estimating. And you think? And, I would, if I had to make a wild guess based on reading all the... Uh, quantitative stuff and the ethnographies, I'd put it at 30, 70. 30% 30 uh, plant, 70% meat, as the Paleolithic ancestral diet averaged over all the habitats in the world. So just a okay. Great. So it is 1 o'clock, so those of you who need to leave, please feel free. On the other hand, I know others of you have important questions. So in contrast to our usual tradition, we're going to go on for another five to seven minutes. My question is more about um, the, um, the pace of change 
in the human species at the onset of um, agri, uh, the agriculture. Um, is, what, what's your take on that? I mean, I, my understanding was that it slowed down. There wasn't the same impetus for change. Life became a little easier. Change, you mean cultural and technological change? Uh, cultural. Cultural, uh, yeah. Well, I, as it I, relates to uh, what we eat. As it relates to what we eat. Well, I mean, people, people after the transition to agriculture were often restricted in the range of their diet compared to, to hunter-gatherers. Uh, they had to, they, their populations increased in density and, and they had to, to keep producing uh, mostly grains uh, in, in the more complex agricultural societies that we call civilizations. And, uh, and they just didn't have the range of, of, of nutrients, they didn't have access to wild foods in great variety. And, um, and so, yes, I think that, that uh, the diet stayed, stayed less varied and more, and more stable over time in those settings. The pace of genetic change. Uh, well, we know there are complex interactions between cultural change and, uh, and genetic evolution. Uh, it's called gene culture, co-evolution. I recommend William Durham, Durham's book on that subject. But uh, in the case that I mentioned of lac the, the evolution of the lactase uh, gene, you have a cultural change, which then causes a, a genetic evolutionary process. Uh, most people think of culture as slowing down evolution, but it doesn't have to be that way. So several years ago, I was doing triathlon, and one thing I noticed is that I really had to change what I eat to match the level of activity, and not just the amount, but also the composition to take higher protein. Now, the reverse is our activity right now in modern society is a lot more sedentary. So do you think that we should be eating the same, uh, same kind of material that people are eating, where they're okay. hunter-gatherer okay. and... This is, this, this is, uh, this is what, what I didn't get to, which is my, uh, my recommendations. And, and, uh, and to some extent, they, they make it irrelevant. But, Kim and I were arguing about the amount of, of meat. Uh, Describe my Thanksgiving dinner table where you have this huge range of, of eating habits and all healthy people. Uh, humans are, are omnivores, so they are good health and long life, which is compatible with a wide range of, uh, of things. So I've, what I've come to recommend is that there's certain things that you shouldn't have a lot of. Um, except for fiber, which you should probably have more of than you have. Uh, you shouldn't have, definitely shouldn't have uh, a lot of refined carbohydrates in your diet. As Kim put it yesterday, don't, don't eat a, anything white. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Coca-Cola is, is brown, and uh, there's plenty of corn syrup in Coca-Cola, and it's, uh, it's a part of the problem uh, of obesity. I'm pretty sure that you should lower your salt intake if you're an average person uh, in the United States. I'm less sure than I used to be about saturated fats, uh, but um, I personally try to keep them relatively low. Uh, and and uh, you know, in the discussion between me and Ken, uh, there was also a question about uh, about how lean the the animal flesh and and fish. Uh, were in uh, in these cultures, and I, you know, I don't, uh, I don't really know, but but we we know that uh, uh, certainly outside of the cold climates, uh, there there's less uh, fat in in meat, and it's and the ratio of of higher uh, uh, ratio of of, uh, of polyunsaturated to saturated fats in, in animal flesh is, is higher. <laughs> so that one I'm a little unsure about to be. Uh, so it's, it's you, you can eat anything what you want, that, but, that you want, but you can eat a, to, to my mind, you can eat a, a 
pretty big range of of things if you if you keep an eye on those particular factors. I guess this builds on that question. Do you think it's if you took people with the same activities, say tri whether they're triathletes or sedentary, that something close to the paleo diet would work really well for some of them and not others? I mean, have have they done trials about? Yes, I'm I'm, I'm virtually sure of that, uh, and uh, and that's a very important point. There are a lot of individual differences, and you've got to find your own place in this in this range. The majority of the human species can't tolerate milk products after <coughs> early childhood. Uh, a very large, uh, probably minority of the, of the species uh, has trouble with gluten. Uh, and, uh, and those are things that you have, to, you have to find out for yourself. A woman who told me I can't stand more than 30 grams of carbohydrate in, uh, in a day I'm not going to argue with her. She's, she's got a diet that works for her. Uh, I wouldn't want it, but uh, and and then uh, I wouldn't be a vegan like my uh, my former son-in-law. Uh, but uh, um, he's he's very healthy, fit guy. So so I'm very I'm much less uh, dogmatic about what you should do. And, than I used to be. Just just watch certain things. Watch for fiber to be adequate. Watch for uh, refined carbohydrates to be not to be a big, big or significant part of your diet, really. And probably watch watch salt and saturated fat levels. And with that, we stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.